race. Black grief is not a grievance. And until black people feel comfortable enough to acknowledge that we are in pain, then there will be no resolution. We must understand that mentioning that it is not about race is not making it comfortable for anyone. This is about race. All of these cases that you see are black people. That's right. So be courageous enough, black people, to acknowledge your pain. Be courageous enough to acknowledge your grief. This is not a grievance. This is history in the making. Yes, that's right. And these are sins from centuries ago that we are now paying for. Be very clear about where we are at this moment in time, black people. And if white people and anybody else, if you are truly our allies, you will acknowledge our pain. You will stand with our pain. You will stand against our pain. And you will feel our pain. So to my young people, do not feel as though that you have to not acknowledge your pain in order to get other people to come along with you. Do not compromise your history. Do not compromise how you feel. And to the police officers who are listening, your badge does not shield you from being a human being. Your badge does not shield you from being a human being. Recognize your spirit. Let's get real about something. Recognize your spirit. You are not a badge. You are a human being. I think a lot of um, people in the Christian church locally that could have been involved just it, they didn't think it had anything to do with race. It, it, it played race in a way that was too uncomfortable. It, the, the race was too in people's face and people just didn't want to deal with that. I think the top reason people are not involved is fear. I think people are afraid. I think people are afraid of black people. So I think when they put, you know, the young African-Americans on the TV screen, um, especially the first night, people were terrified of tattooed African-American young people uh, playing loud music. And so I think that presented, prevented a lot of people from going down. Um, I think if we were being honest, um, what young black people do is pretty close to what young white people do, whether it's playing loud music or whatever. I don't think that they are doing something so distinctly different that um, we should be as fearful of them as we are. Uh, but the narrative was already set. I think the other part, um, the other reason why people were not as involved is um, I think people didn't know what to do. So the, uh, the middle generation, I keep referring to them, so not the baby boomers and not the young people, um, had no practice or training in organizing a protest or a march. Or, so we want to get together and we were kind of at a loss on like what to do. Like, oh, that sounds like a good idea, but how would you organize a march? The murder of Mike Brown is the reason that we came together, but the reason that we have to stay together is because there's injustice in our supposed justice system. We cannot have a racist police force. We cannot have a racist justice system. We need to make change, and we have to do it together. And if we don't get, do it together, it won't happen. And so I think the, the training that maybe could have happened between the baby boomer generation and like the X generation didn't occur around organizing. And so I think there was a, a gap there. And so I think people were not as, as active also because they had young families. And so just like noticing the family dynamic of if you have two parents, then one of you all is gonna have to leave the family in order to be part of the protest. Um, it was a very female-led protest, which means the mom might be that person uh, doing that work. Um, and that also shifts the dynamic if you have two parents, right? But if you're a single mom, that means you have to leave your kids by themselves. And so I think um, that was another kind of uh, conversation that was happening on the ground of Ferguson as people were talking about children being present, but mothers wanting to be part of the protest 
and responsible mothers bringing children with them versus leaving them at home. And you know, I don't think we could even understand that is good motherhood when you don't leave your kids at home by themselves and you allow them to witness change in real time. Many disciples are afraid to upset anyone. And so we avoid conflict like crazy and choose to just say, everything's okay, we won't wade into it. Um, and that's the negative. Sometimes there are theological differences whereby some people are not involved. Some don't know how to get involved. Some uh, look at the news and look at what's going on and, and say to themselves, I can never do that without exploring what other possibilities that we might engage. Sometimes it's just being uninformed. We're all uninformed about some things, um, but you know, there, there are varying reasons why we're not involved. And I think a lot of it has to do with just not knowing. Um, and, and that's not a new thing for the church, uh, which is why God throughout the Old Testament and New Testament constantly wanted to remind people about who God has been, who God is, uh, give revelation so that we might know. Um, we fear what we don't know. We fear what we haven't learned. And I think fear is always a barrier. And one of the things that we try to do in our Christian walk, I think, and that I try to remind folks of here at Webster Groves Christian Church is that um, Fear and love have a relationship with one another and that is it says in scripture that a perfect love drives out all fear. If we can think about what it means to love our neighbors and understand God's love for us, we can overcome that barrier of fear. For two nights after Von Derrick Myers had been shot and we had the ecumenical prayer service here and we left the prayer service and my husband and I had not had dinner yet and we started to drive up Grand to dinner and we got up there and there was a protest group that had that was shutting down the intersection at, at Grand. And I don't I don't know what I I don't know what I thought. I, I just I just thought, well I just need to go around that that corner and and the car was surrounded suddenly and there's some beating on the and I had this thought, I, I was confused. It was kind of like, are, are, you, are you protesting against me? Did, did, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? We want to separate ourselves. Um, and for a moment there, I was afraid. And we turned the car around and we got out of and, and went another way. And I, and I had this tension between agreeing with the protest and having found myself caught in a place in which I didn't know what was going to happen and I had fear. And I then felt guilt about the fear. And I think that, and I think we just live with so many layers uh, <laughs> that, um, and it's hard for us to even admit that. And I doubt that it's just white people who live with several layers. Um, probably, probably we all have those. Uh, tensions within us and my gosh if we could just talk about them because God is in that God's God's spirit is in that place where our experiences and our tensions and our fears and our love for each other and our striving to build relationship come together. It's gonna to be a long journey. It's already been a long journey.
the church was very much and very much is sometimes on the side of injustice by sometimes it's complacency and by sometimes it's silence. Uh, and so it's almost like the spirit of God had to take up residence in a young people because God couldn't get a lot of the church people to do what was needed in terms of reclaiming those bodies um, that are shoved aside and pushed aside and killed and murdered. Couldn't seem to get the church to stand up clearly and in solidarity for, for everyone, including and you know bodies that, black bodies and black boys and girls that are being, being hurt. And it couldn't get the church to really speak clearly about that. Um, and so the spirit of God said, you know, you know, just like Pentecost just kind of had to say, you know what, let me go out to some other folks that may not speak, you know, may not be a part of the traditional church, may not be inside the four walls, but are out here on these streets that can hear my voice and are willing to respond to me and are willing um, to uh, make my voice um, known. No justice! No peace! 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 No peace! Don't shoot. Don't shoot. A lot of the sermons have been about, you know, the spirit of God, uh, you know, being uncontrollable and uncontained and not going to stay in the box of the church. Um, and it seemed like within the protest movement and this new social justice movement, God said, all right, you know, if y'all don't want to speak for me, that's all right. I got some people in in Ferguson, I got some activists, I got some other folks that will speak for me. And I think the faith community in particular is really important because I think maybe what's a little different is, is the articulation of how we make change. So I think during the civil rights movement, much more likely to have said um, doing a prayer beforehand or believing that God was on our side. Um, I think the young people also believe that, I don't think it was articulated that way, um, but I think that was the, the discord, if you will, between the generations is that um, the people who are attending church are often the older generation, not as connected to the young generation. So I, I think the, the, the dreaming, if you will, comes with faith that it could be different. But because the people who believe in faith were also afraid, yeah, um, that whole walk out on faith and not by sight moment, is, this is the moment, right, that that gets tested. Um, and their love for the young people. And I think sometimes that gets missed too. So I, I think the older generation really didn't want any harm to come to the young people. And I don't think that they were malicious in their intent and in not saying fight further for your liberation. I think it was their love for their loved ones and the generation that came after them that um, set up a framing for be happy with where we are because we're further than we've been, but didn't allow for space for um, liberation on how good it could be. And I think that is the faith piece. So when we believe you know, in something bigger than ourselves, and I, I think that's why the faith community is so important because it is that belief that it could be different and then moving in that direction um, that makes change. I'm often frustrated at times um, regarding the lack of involvement of our church, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Not because I think people are bad people. I think we have gifts. I think the disciples of Christ have clergy and lay folks who are trained and have the gifts and talents to make a difference. And I believe that anytime God gives us those kind of graces, that if we pull those resources together, we can change the world. So I'm, you know, I'm often disappointed because we're not engaging to our full capacity. When we don't collectively come together, there's a child, there's a mother, there's a father, there's a community that goes without. And if we are the hands and feet of Jesus, if we don't go, that means there will be communities who won't receive the kind of help, support, or experience the hope that they, they might need. White middle-class people and black Christian folks. Those two parties in particular um, have probably shocked me most. Um, I think Charleston was a bigger wake-up call for the black church than Mike Brown was. And that's problematic for me. But even with that, you still have a huge gap in activism from black congregations. 
we've become walking hypocrites. And that's a problem for me. Um, and the same for the middle class white people who claim that they're liberal and they like to talk about the social justice movements and how we gotta be about it and they love to talk about environmentalism and they love to talk about human trafficking. And you can't see the problem with what happened on August 9th? The fact that it took August 9th for you to wake up, but you consciously continuing to stay asleep, that's a problem for me. People are choosing to stay asleep. You know, sometimes your alarm clock go off in the morning and you ain't really ready to get up. So what you do, you hit the snooze. Mugs are still hitting the snooze over a year later and I don't get it. We can't settle for churches that just preach Jesus and salvation through deeds when we have little black girls and boys being killed on the street. We have to be remnants of Jesus and justice in the lives of the disinherited, those whose backs are up against the wall. In this our anti-black state, we can't be so circumcised that we see the treatment of black bodies and black people and say, well, uh, that's their issue. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. We can't afford to be a white church which fears speaking Black Lives Matter when Christ said that what you do for the least of these, you do unto me. We have no problem saying Jesus lives matter. In these, our homo antagonistic anti-gay times where young folks are subjected to violence daily, family rejection, disproportionate homelessness and HIV, and subjected to bullying and discrimination, we can't afford to just be an open church. We have to be an affirming church. My frustration with, um, I would say, the lack of participation or the lack of support, I think we sometimes felt or feel in the movement um, from a broad spectrum of uh, people in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, uh, it seems to be opposite of what we say we value. And it seems to be opposite of our tradition in terms of, again, caring for community, being in community, saying that all people matter. Um, so if all people matter, why can't black lives matter? Um, but that's not, you know, people don't take it like that. And so I, so my question and my struggle has been, you know, I, you know, here, it's particularly locally, is, you know, when, when you're gonna come out to the streets? When are you gonna get involved? When are you gonna connect? When are you gonna stop being afraid? Um, to go someplace that you haven't gone somewhere, where are you gonna start being comfortable? And uh, being, you know, doing what you've always done, the way you've always done it, in ways that you're always comfortable doing it, uh, and meet Jesus out of, um, where Jesus is, which is definitely in the midst of this, this movement. It was painful when, you know, you call, there's 43 churches in our area and four of them, two of those four are black were active and participating. Um, and we have a ministry that we call anti-racism and pro-reconciling. So that means that we are supposed to be, I believe, people that are ready to have hard conversations on race and face it head on. Yet when it showed up in our own city, not only the, some, most of the local disciples, but it, was, it took a very long time for us to hear from anyone um, in the broad spectrum of the church. When I look back on things before the events of Ferguson, Baltimore, and Florida, I, I believe that the church had become somewhat complacent. We had, we had closed, closed our eyes, uh, put our hands over our ears, and oftentimes I think we didn't want to acknowledge what was happening around us. Not that we didn't care, we were focused on worship. We were focused on membership. We were focused on baptisms. We were focused on liturgy. We were focused on what we knew church to be. And that's what we come together to do. But sometimes we, we fail to acknowledge that things are right there all along, whereby we might can engage uh, the community, provide services, support, and uh, justice initiatives and programs, even mercy programs that might help someone. I think before, before these kind of events, I think the church was focused on the church alone. How are we gonna save our church? 
how we're going to keep the church growing. How can we keep from closing our doors? And so now I believe God is just calling us to imagine what mission is really all about. And mission is not within. Mission is outside of the church. We're afraid of talking about these things because we don't want to lose. You know, um, I can say frankly that I believe that I've had benefits that have to do with my race and my socioeconomic position. And frankly, uh, I've enjoyed being able to drive through a neighborhood and look at the police and think to myself, those police officers are here to protect me and they care about my well-being. I always want that to be true for me. I hope we can find ways that we can encourage conversations um, with and among ourselves and those who provide police and fire protection and military protection so that we all can say aloud that we hope those benefits will be true for everyone. Now, the whole Mike Brown situation struck me. I, I mean, it really struck me. It was very sad that we could see we, history repeating itself. You know, it used to be you take us out and lynch us. Well, now it's you take us out and we don't have to be armed. You shoot to kill us. You know, we, you can't walk down a street and, you know, without the threat of being shot to death. This was an unarmed black man. <laughs> Not even, a, I won't even say an unarmed black man. This was an unarmed black teenager. Walking down the street was his offense. Um, and to see him shot down like that was just, it was horrible. So it really affected me. It brought back a lot of hurts for me personally that I think I had seen as a child. And even as an adult, uh, I lived out in O'Fallon. Missouri, darting prairie to be exact. But out there, I had an incident with racial profiling. And I had to, I, I went and I filed suit. I didn't file suit, I filed a complaint. So basically, I lived again in a predominantly white neighborhood. I was told it was 3% black where I lived by the police officer himself. But I was um, driving, I had just taken my son to football practice and he forgot some piece of equipment, so I'm going home to get it. And I'm right by my subdivision, and a police officer is going the opposite direction as me. And he looks over and he sees me, and he makes a U-turn. So he makes a U-turn, and then he pulls me over, and he says, I'm pulling you over because you're missing, one of your brake lights is out. And I got very, I got very upset. I got very irritated. And I got very mad. I'm like, what do you mean one of my brake lights is out? I had just had my car in the shop two days before. And I had gotten, there was a brake light out. And I had gotten all my brake lights fixed and everything done. And I'm like, what do you mean there's a brake light, brake light out? I'm like, I just got my car fixed and there's no brake light out. And why, how do you stop me? And you were going the opposite direction. My foot wasn't on the brake. So how could you see a brake light out? And he pulls open my door and he's like, get out the car. And I had pulled into the subdivision across the street from mine. All the people were out, Caucasian, walking their kids, walking the dog, and they're looking at me like I'm a criminal. And he, he, like I said, the policeman opens the door and he's like, get out the car. And he says, go stand in back of the car. And he jumps in my car and he slams on the brake. And he said, I had the, there was um, a bar of lights in the back and it's got like little bulbs and it was like six little bulbs. Well, one of the little bulbs was out, one bulb out of six. And he said, see that bulb? There's a bulb light out. And I said, really? And you saw that going the opposite direction without my foot on the brake. I, and I finally, I, I got so mad. I'm like, you know what? Write me a ticket. Just hurry up and write the ticket so I could get home. Write a ticket, let me go. And he says, I will. And he writes a ticket and he throws it at me. And I said, good, can I go now? And I get home and I'm so upset. I mean, I'm crying, I'm furious, I'm shaking. And uh, I told my husband at that time, I'm like, look, I can't drive. I need you to go take my son, his football equipment. Please just go take him the football equipment. 
my husband pulls out the subdivision, different car, gets stopped by the same policeman. Again, the policeman was going in the opposite direction, does a U-turn and stops and pulls them over. Difference in the story, my husband did have a ticket he hadn't paid, traffic ticket that hadn't been paid, so he had a warrant out. They called three Sheriff's County policemen out to arrest him for a traffic warrant. Sir, that has um, killed somebody in St. Louis um, since Mike Brown was killed. So it's got the murders of Kajim Powell um, and um, also uh, Vonderit Myers. I don't know if you all have heard about Vonderit Myers. You know, the police are saying that he was armed, but the autopsy reveals that before the fatal shot was, was um, shot to his head, that his femur was shattered. So he was basically incapable of running. He was not capable of defending himself. And that police officer shot him in the head. And that police officer also had um, very racist things on his Facebook page and talked about killing Muslims and all of that. And he is still employed by the St. Louis Police Department. We also have on the rump roast here, we have the names of the two cops who killed Kajim Powell, yes. who gave him 20 seconds of consideration. And one of those cops that Anonymous has revealed, this man here, um, Randy L. Hayes, on his Facebook page, he brags about torturing a squirrel and spraying the squirrel with pepper spray. Yes, These are the kinds of people that we are paying to protect and serve. You know, the, all of the focus that got turned into the looting, the, the burning, and the robbery, I mean, that that focus is such a smokescreen and such yes. a distraction. Yes. 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 Thank you. Yes. From the issue. And it sickens me because all it does is give people, I mean, when people talk about it, this is what you hear, animals, they stupid, they idiots, they this, they, I mean, there's no compassion. And I'm not saying that you have compassion, you know, pe because they are, people are committing crimes, but what I'm saying is having compassion on a larger global scale. You know, not really understanding, taking a step back and looking from a panoramic view of all the dynamics that are going on that contribute to what happened on Sunday night. Right. You know, but you focus and, and you take your, your focus and you concentrate it on a small portion of what's happening and you got so distracted from the real issue. And the people who can get so riled up about that and not get riled up about what's happening, <laughs> it's something wrong with that. You know, or to say, when you talk about, well, you know, you should get that riled up about black on black. I'm riled up about all of it. So as I think about civic duty and the connection between civic duty and uh, the justice movement, I mean, the best way for me to think about that is what we're learning as we're working on the school to prison pipeline locally. Um, so, you know, when we think about the school prison pipeline going from school all the way to prison, we're realizing, okay, there's a whole juvenile court, there's a whole school system, there's a whole criminal justice system. And to begin to learn what's happening in those and how they interact. I mean, before, you know, before Ferguson, I'm, I mean, just frankly, again, we weren't, we weren't asking these kind of questions. We weren't making these kind of links. I didn't know necessarily, you know, that we had so many municipalities, you know, I would say St. Louis County. And I knew there was, you know, maybe a couple of other ones, but I didn't, I really didn't know how we were organized. I didn't know who my alderman was. I didn't know what ward I lived in, you know, after Ferguson, really woke up. I'm in a new neighborhood. I know what ward I live in now. I know who my alderman is and I've only lived in my new place for three months um, because it's important to, to connect and the decisions that people are making, particularly locally, uh, have a dramatic effect on people's lives. And so um, we've learned that, you know, law laws that are passed on local levels, tickets and traffic 
and stops and all those sorts of decisions, taxes, you know, we have a huge fund here that's based on taxes. Who was paying attention to the fund and who, who was getting money from the fund? Nobody was paying attention to $80 million. We should have, it was coming out of our pockets. So, you know, this movement has made us ask all kinds of questions um, and help us understand that if we are not civically engaged, it is gonna be almost impossible um, to create lasting and systemic change in our community and so we've learned our lesson civic engagement long-term um, changes and policies um, that will long-term give us the systemic changes that we need in our communities one of the reasons that I've been very involved in questions of social justice here in the st. Louis area recently has to do with the fact that though you might not know it by looking at me I'm the father of a 13 year old black boy and um, my son has dreadlocks and uh, is a wonderful young man, as are my uh, other two children, wonderful young man and woman. Um, but when he goes out the door, I know that uh, he is in danger of a kind different than his white brother and white sister are. I worry about how he interacts with the world and the police and how the economic systems in which we live and with which we relate um, will react towards him. And so as a father, I ache as I think about what it means to be involved in those systems. I remember that uh, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ met for our General Assembly in Orlando a couple of years ago. And uh, at the same time that we were meeting, uh, the NAACP was meeting. And it was the time at which um, a, a court case was being settled that uh, had to do with an important uh, crime that had racial elements. And as um, we were sitting there in the hotel hot tub one evening, there were members from the NAACP meeting with us, and um, I was sitting between my two sons, my 17-year-old uh, white son and my, at that time, 11-year-old black son. And uh, a black member of the NAACP was saying to me, how can I raise my teenage son in a world where young teenage black boys can be shot and no justice comes. And I remember thinking to myself, that poor man, how can he live worrying about his black son going out there in the streets? And then I realized that my arm was around my own black son. For some reason, I hadn't internalized the fact that my black son had to live in the same world that his black son had to live in. And I think the reason is, I live in this skin. And I get so many privileges, and I get to live in this skin without having to think seriously about those things. So much so that I hadn't even really taken it seriously that my sons were seen differently in this world. And it made me think, about how important it is for me to listen to the experiences of others and how important it is that in whatever way we can be a presence of justice, we are helping to end injustice. I come from a really diverse um, city and not that it's free of systemic racism, that's for sure. New York is not. Um, however, um, because people have been uh, had to deal with wild diversity uh, for a long time, um, there have been things that have been put in in the system um, to sort of try to combat or work against uh, the systemic racism that is a foundational pillar of American society. Um, but I, I think it robs us of deep relationships with each other. You know, it robs us of. Um, deep spiritual relationships with each other because we're all pretty much separate in our own little corners um, around spirituality um, even though we're you know we might be in the same denomination or we're we're all Christians or we all believe in God you know there's there's strong there's strong lines and boundaries around race and class um, that keep us from really deeply knowing one another and I think that's a great loss um, to us individual, individually and a great loss to humanity for us because, uh, because of racism to not deeply get to know one another and experience the gifts and blessings 
of, of those relationships. Most of white America doesn't have the same experience as law enforcement. And so the idea that a police officer could be mean or racist doesn't naturally come into existence. Where I think people of color have had a very different experience with law enforcement. And so our feelings about Darren Wilson and anybody kind of in the system has had intergenerational um, feelings and, and not just feelings, experiences with them. So it's not like people of color like made this stuff up, like they're living it, right? And so um, it was easy for us to see um, a white officer kill a black person because that's part of our reality unarmed. It, there was no question in our minds that that mother was mourning because she was our sister and that was her child. Um, but I don't think the racial divide allows for Michael Brown to be human and our love for him as a community, like a broad community, not just black community, but as a people, right? I don't think our love across racial line is practiced enough that we could see not just him laying there as somebody's child, but even his mother as a mourning mother, a mourning father, grandmother, brothers and sisters like that. The media is not going to tell us the whole story. I ain't got cable at home, so it's ear to ear thing. So as I was out there talking to the young guy, and they was telling me what was going on, I wanted to break down. I wanted to break down and cry just to hear how the police grabbed him as he was in the car and shot him. And then the police got out the car, his hands was up, and they continued to shoot him several times. They let the body sit there for four plus hours. On top of that, when the ambulance came, they told the ambulance to turn around. They put his body in a black regular truck and drove off. Darren Wilson's just part of the system. He was trained to do what he did and he carried out his training. And so we can villainize him individually or we could work for systemic change within systems, whether it's law enforcement or education or healthcare systems in general. A lot of people talk about we're in the po we're in a post-racial society. You know, Obama's been elected president. We don't have to worry about race anymore. Uh, and so the problem with thinking that just because we live in diverse communities, some of us, or we have exposure to diverse cultures, that systematic racism doesn't exist, um, is that the truth is is that it is. It's a foundational pillar of. Um, American culture um, and you can look at any system and you can see disparities over and over again it's, if you go to health if you go to jo jobs and employment and some people want to say well you know that's just you know because you know black people are black people or black people are the problem and that's why those disparities are there you know um, but when you look at those statistics and, those, and that research deeper, uh, you find very clearly when they're in unemployment that the unemployment rate for African Americans is always double whatever the U.S. unemployment rate is. Um, it, doesn't it doesn't depend on someone's readiness or willingness to work. Um, but that that statistic follows in times of prosperity or social economic depression uh, that statistic holds. And so I think people who, you know, live or, you know, in a lot of diversity have to kind of do their homework and have to listen to people um, in those diverse communities who are telling them, hey, there's a problem, there's been a problem. And I think we also, again, have to address that historical um, that historical racism uh, that has built up a lot of these systems and learn the history. When you hear how, you know, about housing laws, for instance, in St. Louis, that redlined, you know, people from living in certain areas, you need to understand, people have to understand and appreciate that history and, and how it still shapes you know, our communities and how people still live in certain areas and that people were intentional um, about some of the things that they did um, in a racist way. And so to become aware of that and those examples and to root them out um, in our communities because they're there, they're there, no matter how diverse our um, communities 
the, our communities are. Speaking of, you know, in St. Louis, Del Mar Loop, it's one of the most diverse zip codes in the state of Missouri. However, it is also a dividing line. Um, that street divides poor people from the ex extremely, the richest people in the city um, to the poorest people in that city live across the street from each other. Um, so that's a great example of a street that is as diverse as you can make it in the state of Missouri, but yet there the systemic racism, right, is there, right on the street. Everyone is not called to march. Everyone is not called to hold up a sign, to stand in the face of police. Maybe you're called to hug someone. Maybe you're called to give water to a protester. Maybe you're called to prepare a meal for the protesters after it's all over, to come back in, in a safe place whereby they can eat and reflect and talk about what's next. Maybe you're called to be a planner. Maybe you're one that's working with a group of people and have the mind to strategically think about what groups should be engaged and how they should be engaged. Maybe you can be a facilitator, teach people about how to engage social justice. Maybe you can provide reading resources. There are a host of ways you can engage social justice without having to be always in the front. In fact, there's no front to social justice. Everyone needs to work together in order for justice to take place in our community. That's some of the ways that I think we can engage in social justice. I'm excited about the fact that I believe the Disciples of Christ are beginning to open their ears and their hearts to this movement, as many other um, Christians across the country are uh, beginning to open themselves to this social justice movement that was um, initiated in Ferguson. Um, one of the reasons is it's, become, it's starting to come to other people's cities. <laughs> it's starting to come to Baltimore and New York and, you know, South Carolina and North Carolina and it's, it's moving. And so uh, churches and people are finding that, you know, what people are want these issues dealt with. People want to talk about um, policing and people want to talk about uh, violence and people want to talk about um, injustice in their city and the different forms that that takes locally. Um, so one of the things that I'm excited about and have been excited about here and ha as it expresses itself locally is we've been learning, you know? We had a meeting with our local police chief we had never met with our police chief in all these years. We didn't, I can't say I even knew who it was, you know? And so one of, the, one of the things I think that has happened in this movement, and we've seen it in Ferguson and we've seen it spread is, you know, we're becoming more civically engaged. We're becoming more civically aware. We are learning who has what power and who does what. And in ways that I don't think anybody really paid attention to before. So I, I think one of the best things that has happened in this movement is that people are awake. People have been pushed out of their sleep and their slumber, including myself, around certain things from everything from political processes to who you're voting for and why. You know, just asking questions that we never asked. We never asked them before. Learning to meet and build relationships with people that we never bothered to build them with before because we realized that these positions and these roles um, that people have have an effect on the quality of life and community. And for Christians and for people who are part of the kingdom of, of God, uh, we need relationships because we want to shape um, the quality of life um, with our values. It's the media focus primarily on protesting um, creates an image that uh, this is an issue of violence, that it's an issue um, that is only being worked out, if you will, through protest. And actually the opposite is true. What protest does is it brings to our attention the issues that are screaming out in the hearts of these young people. And, and I say young people, it, it's everyone hopefully, but young people have voiced it 
and that's important. And so the work that's to be done is the work that's beyond the protest. And I think that if people only see protest and don't see the conversations, don't see the creative work being done, then the whole issue is, is distorted. So that may be as simple as filing papers, right? My mother has MS, um, but she's super conscious. Like, I'm pretty sure that's where I get my consciousness from. Actually, both of them, my, both my parents. Um, so she can't be out there marching, right? Like, that's just not her role. But when we had Ferguson October, she volunteered to do administrative work, right? Because there was a role for her to play. There's always a role to play. Think about social justice and all of the issues that, that plague our city. It's impossible to do everything. It's important for us as the church to do our little part, our, our little neighborhood, our corner, our family, the neighbors next to us, to get to know them because we can make a difference one block at a time. And um, there's so many different issues that we can address you gotta kinda know what you're called to. Uh, just because it's social justice doesn't mean you should do all of them. If children is your focus, the juvenile justice system is your focus, if it's uh, creating clean and safe neighborhoods, if it's advocating, if it's health, do what you can in your own neighborhood and I think it'll make a difference across the globe. Go do conquer. <laughs> That's what I want you to know. Go do conquer, do something. It's so easy to sit at home and say, oh, I can't do that, or it's not my issue, it's not my fight. Oh, they'll be okay without me. But we won't be. It takes each one of us. It takes us doing, even if it's just the little part, do what we can. Just go do. It's so easy to be so focused on self and live in that little bubble that we can't see others around us. We can't see their hurt, their pain. We can't see their injustice. A lot of times we, I'm gonna say, especially we as Christians, we like, I'm free now. You know, but we forget about those people that are still oppressed. We, we live in such a society where a lot of times it's like, I made it. Uh, and you forget about those that are not as fortunate as you. Or we get to that frame of mind where we think everybody lives with like us. Well, I did it, why can't they? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, stop being lazy, but yet we don't see the, the systematic oppression that has been happening for centuries that don't allow that person to pull themselves up or we don't believe it. Sometimes even after we hear it and we're exposed to you know, different things, we still don't believe it. Well, why can't they move so-and-so and get their children a better education? Why don't they move out to those areas? Well, let's look at where they are with their income level. Oh, well, they need to go to school and get a better job. Well, what's keeping them from going to school and getting a better job? You know, they try and get in the schools, but their education was so far behind and lacking in unaccredited school districts that they couldn't get into a college if they wanted to. Let's talk about those issues. Let's start looking beyond the pull yourself up by your bootstraps and I made it, so why can't you? And I think so often, and I'm gonna say I was the person that thought like this. Everybody, if I could do it, if I could graduate college, anybody could do it. Why can't you? And then you start realizing not everybody is like me. Sometimes you have to stop just hanging around people that look like you, or people that act like you, or people that are in your same social economic circle, and actually look to people that aren't and find out people are very different. You know, I met some people and I'm friends with some people and I love some people that, oh my God, I never thought in life I would associate with. Oh my God, they're so whatever that label may be, but you find out they are some of the brightest, sweetest, most intelligent people. You know, a lot of times it's just getting yourself out of your own, your own space.
and, and learning to look at the world around us as it is, not as, as we see it.